We're starting. <laughs> Hi, welcome. Hello. Ah, Thank there you. we go. <laughs> so, um, my name is Dominic. This is Brock. We are working for, for many, many years together on, uh, on this thing called Identity Server, which is an, you know, an, an extension to, to ASP.NET Core, if you like, um, uh, that adds certain server capabilities like you know, OpenID Connect and OAuth and so on. So our day-to-day -day job is, is dealing with ASP.NET Core security. So we have many customers. Well, I guess all of our customers these days are on ASP.NET Core um, security. Uh, 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 um, um, the, the latest version. So, a lot of the times, you know, um, they they ask themselves, I is this platform? Does it have all I need, so to speak, to implement the thing I want to implement? Yeah. So, the the idea behind behind this uh, talk was basically to give you an overview, like a checklist of all the important security features that are inside of ASP.NET Core. Um, so that you can validate yourself, you know, is, is everything in there that I need to build um, an application, okay? You can imagine it's a lot of material, uh, so we just did a two-day workshop just on some of the aspects of ASP.NET Core security, so in 60 minutes, really, it's, it's, it's really an overview. Don't expect that we can go into any area in too much detail, yeah? That's why I added a, um, a couple of uh, references on the slides, uh, for you that you can go afterwards, go learn more, okay? Like more reading material, more samples, uh, and so on. So basically, the, the idea is um, I uploaded the slide deck to here. So you just, you know, take a picture of that or write it down. Uh, then you can get to the slide deck, and from the slide deck, you can get to all the other further reading links, so to speak, okay? Um, yeah. So we've come a long way with ASP.NET security. Does anyone remember this here? Yeah? A couple of people? <laughs> uh, how many of these five options actually work? <laughs> none. none. <laughs> <laughs> you mean none of them or the none? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, none works. You're, you're right. Um, what was Passport? Does, does anyone remember what Passport is? Is anyone old enough in the room? Passport was a product from Microsoft that got pulled before version 1.0 of ASP.NET, but no one updated the enum. So it, it, it's still in there. Uh, Federated was a, a, their, their second attempt to put some modern security stuff into ASP.NET. It got pulled before they released it, and no one updated the enum. <laughs> so yeah, we have a couple of options, and some of them work. Okay. Um, I even spent, you know, if if you remember one thing from this talk, never ever write a book. Yeah, it's it's, it's a waste of time. Um, <laughs> I, I even spent like 14 months of my life documenting all of these things in ASP.NET. Um, I think four weeks after this book got released, there was ASP.NET 3.0. <laughs> um, so you know, pretty much. No, uh, did did did, did any, anyone read this book in the room? Did anyone? No, that's what I thought. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I didn't think that one of the three people were here today. <laughs> yeah, so, but actually, that, that was one of, the, one of the first projects we worked together on. You were, uh, Brock was a reviewer um, of that book, and you know, anyways, that's all gone. Um, <coughs> so yeah, so this is basically our, our, our um, starting point. Yeah, um, that's the type of architecture that many people build these days, right? We have front ends, we have back ends, we have back ends for back ends. And uh, you have some security requirements there, you know. Um, we have multiple front-end types and technologies, and uh, the users need to be able to authenticate to our backends. And, you know, that might be JavaScript and, uh, and, and native applications and web applications and server-to-server -server style uh, communication and so on. Um, that's one thing. Um, we often have, uh, you know, call patterns where someone calls the service, but maybe also where the service delegates the identity to the next hop um, in the system. Um, typically, you have something called an identity provider, which abstracts away all of the authentication needs so that regardless how this user comes into your system, it's always the same user and you don't have to implement all of the, you know, the, these variations uh, in, in multiple places. Typically, you have something like an, a, a policy, an authorization policy system um, that can, can come in many shapes or forms um, to basically you know, implement the question like who is the user and what is he allowed to do and you know, um, the more 
building blocks we're adding, this gets more complicated. So we need a, a, a solid framework to be able to, to implement that. Yeah? So uh, we're going to look at the most fundamental um, security services provided by ASP.NET Core. So we're going to go uh, on, you know, from, from, from bottom to, to um, top. Um, not a lot has changed, to be honest, in the last year or so in, in security, which is a good thing, right? Because all the years before, Microsoft changed their stuff on a yearly basis, and, you know, breaking changes. For the last year, I think, it, it, it was stable, which I think is a good thing in security. Um, but you all know that 3.0 is coming out soon, so it's their <laughs> chance again to break stuff. <laughs> yeah. um, um, and I'm going to point out some, some of the things that are coming in, in the next version. Okay? Um, again, all of the samples that Brock's, Brock's going to show, they are um, available on GitHub um, using this, this URL. Okay, let's get started. So first thing, hosting. Okay, so before we even think about running our application or how designing our application, you, you, you know, you, you want to host it somehow. Um, Microsoft has this new web server called Kestrel. It, it's not that new anymore, right? It's a couple of years old now. But in, 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 in uh, web server years, <laughs> it's pretty uh, young, OK? So um, when they first released that, uh, the, 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 re the recommendation was, don't use Kestrel on the internet. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it, it's very new. We, we don't know yet how good it really is uh, from, from, a, from a security point of view. So they, they said, like, the only supported configuration of Kestrel is you know, that, that you have a reverse proxy in front of it, that, you know, something that is proven, battle-tested, like Nginx or Apache or IIS, something like this. And then this uh, basically takes the traffic from the outside world and then forwards the traffic to Kestrel and, you know, and the way back. Um, starting with version 2, they actually did a lot of penetration testing on Kestrel, got in many companies, and they, you know, were all pretty happy that they finally can test a new web server because who writes new web servers these days? And Starting with version 2, it's now a, a completely supported uh, configuration, so to speak, to have Kestrel running on the edge. But I think I wouldn't do it. Okay? I still think it's a very new web server, and attackers are very creative, and I uh, don't... W would you do it? You're not ready yet. I'm too old, maybe? No, no, no. <laughs> well, maybe they're not ready yet. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, uh, even with, with that now being allowed, I still prefer this kind of configuration where you have something in front that, you know, has many, many years uh, of, of being security tested, like Nginx, for example, or Apache or IIS, okay? Um, that being said, <laughs> if you want to do that, be prepared to tweak a lot of, you know, parameters, because obviously a web server is a complex thing. And they, they, they try to give you a good compromise between security and performance. So lots of things to tweak to make it work for your application, you know, like you know, timeouts and, and limits and sizes and, and what, whatever. Um, it, it, it has built-in support for HTTPS now, so that's good. Um, even even with, with, the, with the reverse proxy scenario, you can still do HTTPS between the proxy and the, the final web server if that is important for you. Um, they have support for both static HTTPS and SNI server name indication, where you can dynamically choose the HTTPS certificate based on the host header name. So yeah, it's, it's, it's getting there, I think. I still would prefer the old school setup, I think. Good. Um, so once you are inside the host, so to speak, um, then basically ASP.NET Core is basically consists of two building blocks, uh, middleware and services. Okay. Uh, the middleware is, is the thing that runs on the request pipeline, and the reason you write middleware is because you want to get invoked automatically when a request comes in or a response goes out. But the middleware itself typically doesn't have a lot of logic. It pulls from services from the uh, DI container. Okay? So all, it turns out all security services in ASP.NET Core are services in, in a dependency injection container, and that's just what the middleware is using or what your code would be used or what their plumbing is using, basically. So let, let, let's have a look at those. The most fundamental one is data protection. So you have many, many situations in, in your web application where you need to protect data, okay? The, 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 probably the most common one would be protecting a cookie, right? So you're issuing a cookie, you put some data in there, you want to make sure no one can change that cookie or look inside or tamper with it, and on the way back, you want to validate that cookie. Um, so that, that, that requires crypto, right? And when you hear the word crypto, your first question should be, and where is the key? Yeah? Do you remember this? 
the machine key element in ASP.NET. Yeah? It was your master key, right? Um, so you had to create a master key um, and, and put it into your config file. And you know, that pretty much became the most important key or, or string in your application, because whoever had access to that string could create cookies that looked like they come from you, right? And because this was the most important string in our application, we put it into clear text into a config file on our web server, right? <laughs> yes, makes total sense. <laughs> it's a bit of an outdated design. Yeah? They had to fix that. Um, this key was literally impossible to rotate, to change, without breaking users that are currently using your application. So they basically changed the whole thing. There is now a, a, an official data protection API in ASP.NET Core. And the first thing they had to fix was store that key outside the application and not inside the application. You know, uh, actually, go one back. You wouldn't believe how many GitHub repos have machine keys checked in, for example. Yeah. <laughs> um, or if you want to have fun, try this on Google, which searches for the word machine key in files uh, that, en uh, that end with config. <laughs> um, you'll be uh, surprised. Yeah. OK. Uh, I think in some countries it's illegal to give this advice. Yeah, we I think it is. Show that, yeah. uh, in, in the states. In I the think, states, uh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but we are not in the states. That's good. <laughs> um, anyways, um, so the first thing they had to fix was that key material has to live outside the application, yeah? um, and that that's a good thing. But obviously, it creates a little bit more um, complexity. Yeah. So they, they they have some default values where they store those keys when you are on your local developer machine. They're going to use your user profile. And in, inside the user profile, I think we have a screenshot of that. Just mm -hmm. go on. Yeah. Inside your user profile, if you drill down all these uh, folders, you'll find uh, a, a folder called data protection keys. Okay? And that's where they store the master key for your machine. And then e each application basically is deriving keys um, from that master key um, for their certain purposes. Okay? So go one back again. Now, this is all fine for local development scenarios, but once you deploy the application to the server, you have to make up your mind, where do I want to store my keys? Okay? Um, obviously, Microsoft being Microsoft, yeah, when, you, when you deploy to Azure, right, um, there's some magic pixie dust they can put over your deployment, and it just, they, they take care of it in, in the background. Yeah? But if you are, have any sort of load balanced or redundant deployment, that you're doing yourself, you have to find a shared location to store these keys, right? It could be a file share, it could be a database, it could be Redis, uh, could be uh, whatever, right? Um, it's, it's extensible. Why am I men mentioning that to you? Because we have many customers um, that weren't aware of this. Because this API is, for most parts, invisible, right? It just works. Yeah? It, it does, does, does its job behind the scenes. And as every good security API should be, it should be not, it not getting in the way. OK? Um, but now you are completely unaware that, that this thing actually exists. You, you deploy it to your server, and suddenly you get weird behavior. Or intermittently. Uh, yes, and that might manifest itself as your users are not able to log in, right? Because you, you have a load balanced environment. Server 1 creates a cookie. That cookie goes to server 2. They don't have the, the same key material. Server 2 will say, like, uh, this cookie is invalid. User is signed out. OK? So let's have a look at how we can reproduce this problem just to, to, to show you that it's, <laughs> it's really a problem. Yeah, so uh, this is a sample application showing you how you would configure the data protection system in your, your application. Uh, and here's our uh, you know, configuration of our dependency injection system. Uh, this is adding data protection. And by the way, never ever do that. What, what, what we are doing here, <laughs> because we are just storing the keys in the current directory, and that's just for demonstration purposes. Please don't do that. Yeah. Okay? yeah, so this is the big one that you want to know about, is deciding where to put the keys uh, on your system. So I have a lot of customers that do AWS deployment, and they have to configure this in their application. So um, one of the built-in functions is to, for Microsoft is to put them somewhere on your file system. So we're just putting them in the current directory. And I don't know if you can see here, but... We don't have any key text files right now in the current directory. Okay? Um, and so we have a sample where we're going to just um, use the data protection API directly. If I can run this. And we're going to encrypt a string, you know, protect a string, and then unprotect a string. And that's okay? going to be the most boring demo in the yeah. world. So, so we put in hello world, right? We call protect. This is uh, just our MVC controller using the data protection API directly. Um, so you can use this yourselves. And we're 
you know, getting our, our protected string here. Okay? So that's very much like what Microsoft would do with their cookies internally. So over here now in my file system, notice I have a new file, key-somegwid.xml. So this was dynamically created the first time that a key needed to be used to do data protection. Uh, they put it in the location we told it, which is you know, in production, not here. You shouldn't be doing it here. And they have some information in here about the key. Um, one of them is about the, the, the creation date. And they have this notion of an activation date. So the idea is they create these keys, and they're good for, or they're, they're being used for 90 days. And the interesting thing is then after 90 days, they actually create another key. So internally, they do key rotation, which is kind of a good practice when you have key material. They still keep the old ones to unprotect old you know, data that was protected with the old ones, but new data will be protected with the new keys. Okay? So you'll actually get accumulate several keys over time. And um, you know, this is actually then being protected uh, with some local crypto so that if you steal the file, that you know, nobody will be able to then have the keys. So let's lose our keys. OK, so let's imagine you do, in fact, lose your keys. So we'll delete this file. OK, I'm going to shut down my web server. Uh, where is my web server? Oh, I'm in the console. OK, I'm shutting it down because it had cached the key in memory. Right? So I want to reboot or act as, as if it's another server. OK, and I'll go back over here and now try to unprotect. OK, and it is unable to unprotect the data because the key that it was protected with is now gone. OK, so the okay. So, so if you're seeing these exceptions in your log files, that's exactly the problem you're hitting, that for some reason your servers are not synchronized in terms of, of, of the keys. Yeah. Okay? And it's, uh, the, the worst day to figure out this problem is on, production, uh, on, 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 <laughs> on, on deployment day. Yeah. Okay? So you, ha you have to plan ahead for that. Uh, just briefly, this is the interface. Uh, that you could use, again, directly if you wanted to from your application. Uh, and you create this protector. And the APIs are dirt simple, right? Protect, unprotect. You don't have to worry about crypto or key material. OK. Cool. Um, yeah, next one, next one. Um, where is this used? Um, cookies is probably the most common one that, uh, you know, um, anti-forgery tokens, um, it's, um, it's used there as well. When, you, when you're doing OAuth and, ACE and OpenID Connect, there, there's this state parameter that needs to be protected. They're using it for that as well. If you're doing Razor pages, you might know the temp data attribute. That's used here as well. And as Brock just showed, you can use it yourself as well. And it, it's a very useful API when you want to you know, transport data from one page to another, and you want to make sure nobody can change the data and so on. Yeah, and then you protect it and, and send it over a query string or whatever, or a form post. And then on the receiving end, you unprotect it again and can make sure nobody has tempered your data. OK? Cool. So once that base infrastructure is in place, we can now move one level up. Um, which is the authentication system. And that's probably the, the biggest subsystem in, 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 in security terms. Um, and, you know, you, you've seen that enum, right? Authentication mode equals something, yeah? Uh, that we've come a long way from that <laughs> system to, to here, okay? So first of all, in, in the old world, you could only choose one authentication method at a time um, where, you know, and that was pretty impractical. So in ASP.NET Core, we have a completely revamped authentication system. You can have as many authentication uh, methods in, at the same time in your application. They um, you know, uh, support the most popular social providers um, like Google, Facebook, Twitter, and so on. Um, there are lots of com community projects out there which add support for the not so big social ones. Well, they're, they're also big like, you know, Dropbox and GitHub and Yahoo, um, <laughs> real Yahoo. big. Yeah. What, what, what was that again? <laughs> um, and, and other really important services like Battle.net, for example, Untapped. You know, the, the, the really important authentication systems of, um, in the world. Um, then we have support for all of the big standard space protocols: OpenID Connect, WS Federation. They both come from Microsoft. If you have to interact with SAML, yeah, like governments and banks use a lot of SAML. There's um, um, an open source project from a guy called Anders. I, I call him Mr. Saml, yeah, because whenever I have a Saml question, I ask him. He, he knows that stuff inside out. And if you want to use Saml, that's probably the best library to use for that. Um, if you're doing API security, you need support for token-based authentication. So JSON Web Tokens is the most common thing to do here. That's built in as well. And then um, uh, when it comes to session management, 
they have an, a, an API you know, for, for signing in users, signing out users, session management, and uh, a default implementation which puts stuff into cookies, but that is replaceable, as we'll see um, in a second as well. Um, yeah, we can skip that part. Um, this here is how you interact with the authentication system. Um, there's an interface which lives in the DI container. It's called the iAuthentication service, and there are five methods on it that deal with the five different things that you typically do. Uh, first of all, of course, authenticating something, right? Like uh, validating a cookie or validating a token, you know, these kind of things. Um, session management, yeah, starting a session is called sign in. Stopping a session is called sign out. Um, telling the system that authentication is required, meaning either go to a lo local login page, go to a remote login page, you know, these kind of things. Telling the system that access is denied, which pretty much is a, you know, your last resort, like I can't go from here, access is denied, show some page, <laughs> access denied, I guess. <laughs> Contact your administrator or something like that. Um, yeah. Um, that's how you set it up. Yeah, um, we, we, we don't have to, have to go into details here, but basically you wire up these handlers in the DI container, uh, and once they're wired up there, you can use this iAuthentication service to talk to them. You never talk to them directly because there is some coordination and orchestration <laughs> necessary internally. That's why you have to go through that abstraction called the iAuthentication service. Uh, another thing I should just briefly mention, they have some built-in support for same site cookies, which is a new feature in browsers. Um, which is very useful for making your cookies more secure. Read up on that if you care about these things. But the, the, the main point here is uh, you get same site by default now because all of the cookies are now um, set to same site legs, which is um, you know, not the most secure, uh, secure setting, but the most compatible setting and gives you some good extra security. Um, Session management is interesting, right? You want to log in a user to your system and, and sign him out again. Um, that's how you do that. Basically, you call the sign in method um, on this authentication service. Um, it's all based on claims now, right? So that's how you model the identity of the user by basically creating some claims like name and uh, I, I subject ID and first name, email address, whatever you want to model, basically. Uh, and then you pass that claims principle to the session handler and it will basically serialize it into a data structure, typically a cookie. Yeah? Um, they also have support for metadata in, in the session. Don't confuse that with their session feature. It's, it's, it's the same name, I guess. <laughs> but it's more for like um, security-related information, something you want to hard uh, couple with the login of a user. So maybe you, you have some access token that you want to use to call an API on behalf of that user, and that should be associated with that user. So yeah, it's maybe a, um, a, a, an option, at least, to, to, to store it inside of the authentication session of the user so it, you know, they belong together, so to speak. Yeah? OK. Um, and I'm going to show you a demo in, in a second that brings all of these things together, like, like a bigger demo, or Brock will show it. Um, there, there are many things you can do to, to, to customize the session management as well. So for example, there are uh, events that, 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 that get invoked, like for example, whenever a cookie comes into your system, gives you a chance to run some code and say like, okay, this cookie is valid, but is this user still valid in, in the database? Or is he dis has he been disabled in the meantime, for example? Do I need to invalidate that cookie, for example? It gives you access to the sign out uh, workflow. So if at sign out time you want to clean up data, for example, delete, cache entries, whatever, That's, that, that can be done. Um, the, 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 the actual implementation of the session mechanism is also pluggable. By default, Microsoft just stores everything in the, in the cookie. That's probably not the best idea, especially when you start making use of that feature, because cookies have certain size restrictions, right? Especially um, when you use uh, browsers like Safari, you know, they, they have very tight uh, limits on, on cookie sizes. But the point is you can plug in other persistence mechanisms like a, a database or a cache, you know, um, so that the, the cookies stay small and you also get this um, revocation feature. So, you know, all you need to do is to invalidate a, a cookie or, or a session rather is to delete it from a, from a cache and then, then the user is signed out, you know, nice, nice, uh, clean uh, feature. Okay. External authentication means that we don't do our own authentication, but use some external provider for that, like Google or you know, Azure AD or what, what, what have you. Um, 
They have built-in support for that as well, of course. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's called a remote authentication handler, and they know basically how to send the user to this external system, and they know how to process whatever comes back from, from, from that external system to validate who the user is. You know? um, we'll see, we'll see that in, in a second. And the last point about API, uh, about authentication is APIs, right? So if you want to secure APIs, uh, they also have a handler for that. It's called the JSON Web Token Handler. And that the job of this handler is to you know, look at incoming requests, validate the tokens, and, and uh, you know, turn them into claims. Um, one thing is missing. If you care about these things, there's a spec called RFC 7622, which is token introspection, meaning uh, it's not a JSON web token. It's some other token type. And there's an endpoint on the network that can validate it instead of yourself. Um, we provided that handler. Um, it's, it's on GitHub. So if you need that, you can plug that in as a replacement for this. This also works very well. So we have one um, demo that brings all of these things together. Um, you know, it, it, it's a lot of information, but as I said, um, it's, it's uh, basically for, for giving you an overview. But, but this, um, this uh, sample here basically takes all of the things I just talked about and uh, turns them into you know, one, one coherent thing. Yeah, what we have here is uh, uh, an MVC application. And the idea is that this MVC application is going to uh, log a user in, and it's going to use an external authentication system using OpenID Connect. Uh, once we get back the authenticated user, we will you know, establish a local session with the cookie. And then this application wants to call a web API on behalf of that user. So we have another project over here, which is running a web API. Uh, so over here, this separate API project is also, of course, wanting to authenticate calls. So it does token-based authentication, expecting a, uh, a JSON web token. Okay? So this API project, let me run that just to get it up and running. Okay? Uh, we now have our, um, um, excuse me. So over here in this application, um, we're going to be wiring open, uh, up ID, open ID Connect. Um, there's another important part of this is when an application is calling web APIs, you have this token and this lifetime management uh, that you have to deal with with this token. Uh, so we have a nice little sample here that's going to help that. So let me just run this to get logged in first and show you first what we get back, and then we'll deal with uh, calling our API. So here's the MVC app. Um, I'll trigger my secure page. This just has a, you know, an authorized attribute uh, on the application. Actually, let me show that as well. Uh, I think up here we have a, a global authorize. Uh, we'll talk more about that when we talk about the policy system, but the entire application uh, requires an authenticated user. So what we've done now is redirected up to some centralized identity system somewhere. Uh, and I'll log in with a user called Bob that I have up here. All right, we get a consent screen. This is basically, you know, hey, yeah, this is all the information that we're about to send back to the application, including uh, access to this API. So when we come back, We'll come into this application, and we've now authenticated from the external system. We have claims coming back from that external system, and these have been issued into our cookie. Okay. The other thing that's in the cookie, as Dominic mentioned, is metadata. And this metadata is a place where all this other information is stored. One of the things that is stored in here is, uh, are the tokens coming back from the token server. So we have an access token, and this is what we're going to send to the web API. Um, this ID token is the, the token that authenticated us in the first place. Uh, and we also have this thing called a refresh token, and that's for using uh, to go get new access tokens uh, when this access token expires. Okay. Um, so right now, what we have is a, a button here where we can call the API. Um, so actually, I think that's already in place. Uh, we can call that, and this is taking that access token, sending it to our API endpoint, and that was successful. Okay. So. Um, that's great. We now have authenticated the user external authentication, tracking with a session using the authentication system in ASP.NET Core, you know, calling that API. Uh, the last little interesting thing here, then, is this uh, token management. So again, I mentioned the token is going to expire at some point, and we use a refresh token to renew that. That code is um, a little bit tedious, and you don't want that you know, mixing into your application code. Um, so we've come up with an interesting little technique uh, which taps into the cookie events. Dominic mentioned that there's a, an eventing system uh, off of the cookie handler. And so uh, what we have here is 
uh, a class that will implement these events for the cookies. Uh, and there are some virtual methods that, that you can uh, implement. One of them is validate principal. So this is invoked every time the cookie comes into the application. After the cookie has been validated by the, by the built-in cookie handler, then you get a chance to take a look at it. And so what we're doing here is we're not using it to check to see if the user is still active. We're actually leveraging this to get the token, our access token for the API. Um, we are checking the expiration on it. Right? When you get the tokens back, you know how long uh, it, it will uh, be valid for. And we're checking to see if we're within some threshold. So the token you get back is good for about an hour. So what we'll do is we'll use it for 58 or 59 minutes. And then, oh, it's about to expire. So what we'll do then is we will connect back to the token server and use the refresh token, get a brand new access token, uh, and then we'll update our cookie metadata with the latest token. So what's nice about this is it's a sort of a seamless way to add into your project a way to automatically refresh the token without this being in your API code, right, when you call the API. Um, so I think our tokens are good for, what, one minute or something? 70 seconds. Yeah. 70 seconds. OK, so I've been sitting here talking for more than 70 seconds. So this is the current access token, and this is the refresh token we have. So I'm going to hit refresh. And what's going to happen is the cookie is going to come back in with these tokens. We're going to see that the token expiration is past our threshold. So this should just automatically uh, refresh this. So if I hit refresh, yeah, notice it changed. OK? So it's a nice little easy way to, to put this into the pipeline. If I hit refresh now, yeah, it's, I'm still not within my threshold. So in 50 more seconds, it will, it will do another renewal. Can you also show the code how you call the API? Oh, yes. Just to show that this is really free of all of these details. Yes. Right. So when you call the API, right, you need the token. So there's a helper provided to read the access token out of the metadata in the cookie. Um, we are getting a uh, HTTP client to connect to the web API. We can use this little helper method to set the access token as the authorization header right, using the bearer scheme, and we just call the API. So the point is, this is pretty uh, simple code with calling the API and not worrying about token management. Okay? Uh, one more thing is that uh, at sign out time as well, um, that's another event that you can handle on the cookie events, which is, hey, the user's signing out. So the kind of the good proper cleanup uh, is to go and uh, get your refresh token. And if I go down here far enough, we will revoke it. Okay, the user signed out. That means the refresh token should no longer be valid. So we're you know, cleaning up the tokens at the token server. Okay, good. All right. OK, so that's authentication. Authorization is another huge topic yeah, that we could talk for days, I guess, about it. Um, so authorization, Microsoft rewrote the authorization system. Well, actually, th there was not much to rewrite, to be honest, because the older versions didn't have a lot. Yeah? Um, but in uh, ASP.NET Core, they have a new authorization system. It, it's actually two systems, even if they are internally the same. But there, there are two flavors, if you like, how to use them. One is called policy-based authorization. And the idea is that is the replacement for the old authorized attribute, right? Um, Authorized, there was this authorized attribute where people used it to, to either say like roles equal something, right? So it's to, to enforce certain role memberships. And since we all know that roles are not very useful or you know, not, don't go far enough, what many people did was they wrote their own authorized attribute, right? Um, to be honest with you, I've, I've done a number of code reviews where people wrote their own authorized attributes and they did it wrong. Because you have to derive from a base class, you have to be aware of what the base class is doing to call the base first or the after, you know. And if, if you get that wrong, you get subtle security holes in your authorization system. So Microsoft basically uh, uh, um, removed that feature. You can't write your own authorized attribute anymore. Okay? What you are doing instead is you're creating so-called policies. And policies can be invoked from the authorized attribute. Um, and, you are t and, and the policy system is completely extensible, but you can't ex uh, replace the authorized attribute anymore. Okay? And the whole point of the policy system is that you basically can look at the incoming request, check the properties of the user, and if he fulfills certain requirements, you allow him through, otherwise you access deny. Yeah? 
There's another system called resource-based authorization where in addition you can also have a look at the resource that this user is trying to manipulate, like updating a customer or deleting an invoice, you know, these kind of things. Yeah? Um, it's all DI-based again, so it, it, it's, it's actually testable now, which wasn't possible with the old system, and that's a good thing for security. Um, Actually, if you want to learn more about that, there's a really good learning resource um, from the guy that actually is responsible for the authorization API at Microsoft. Uh, his name is Barry. You might know him from Twitter. He's uh, swearing a lot. <laughs> um, and he wrote a, a, like, like a, um, like a hands-on workshop, so to speak, how to learn the different you know, uh, aspects of the authorization system. Um, in, f in, in the next version of ASP.NET Core, this will be available as middleware as well. So right now, it's pretty much only used by MVC, yeah, the, the authorization API. But since, um, since uh, they, they want to open more scenarios in the next version, like for microservices and routing outside of MVC, it's going to be, uh, 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 you know, like uh, an authorization middleware will be available as well. OK. Um, do you want to show just a demo of the yeah, system? Yeah, we'll just go probably, do that. Probably is more, more exciting than slides. OK. So this is another sample we have for showing the authorization system. Uh, what I have is I'm simply logging in a user, first of all, right? You have to authenticate someone before you can authorize them. Uh, just to show you who our users are, I have just a hard-coded list. And let's say we have Alice and Bob. And so Alice is uh, in the sales department, and she's a senior you know, executive in the sales department. So that's all well and good. And the idea is that in your application, you're going to want various uh, authorizations. So the way you set up using policies is we add the authorization system into the DI, and this provides add policy methods. This is where you create a named policy, which then has the requirements that a user must satisfy. So think of it as kind of like a permission, right? It's the name of something, and I'm expecting this about the user. So the way these policies work is that they are looking at, the cl in this case, the claims on the, the user. Okay? These are very simple. So an example, uh, it's a sales-only sort of permission. You must be in the sales department. You must be a senior salesperson. Well, you need to be in the sales department and level senior. So these are, are both must be satisfied for the policy to succeed. Um, and then over here on my test controller, I have various attributes. Uh, that's the same authorized attribute, but now when you pass in a string, you're indicating the name of the policy. Okay? So you can do these declaratively using the attribute. Uh, also, as Dominic mentioned, the authorization service is in the DI system. So you can resolve it from the DI system uh, and invoke this programmatically. Right? So you can invoke it uh, you know, within your method to uh, you know, enforce this. This is also a good way to invoke a policy to um, update your UI and like hide and show menus and buttons. If the user is not even allowed, don't show them the button, for example. Okay? So I can just run this quick. And I have something else running. I think I'm going to have to close this. Oh, lucky. OK. Alice, Alice, great. So I'm logged in as Alice, and we have our, our claims. Okay, so now when I go and invoke that sales only, because Alice is in the sales department, you know that succeeds, of course. Uh, senior sales, right? She has those two claims, so that one works. That's a different policy, but I have another one uh, which I didn't show you, but it uh, I think it's requiring that you only be an intern, for example. So you're only in the the intern uh, status in in that particular department. So that one should fail. Okay, and so what's happening under the covers? is that the authorize attribute here was calling the challenge or the, the for, you know, forbid methods, right? And the forbid is sending us to the access denied page. Um, if you're doing it imperatively, then it's up to you to call forbid if that's what you want, or something else custom. OK, good. Um, yeah, and uh, just go back, please, to the startup. Yeah. Um, so what, what this kind of gives you the impression is now that um, for, for being able to use that authorization system, you need a everything as a claim, okay? which is wrong. Yeah, just, just because you have this shiny new hammer, not everything becomes a nail now. Um, so, um, but Microsoft provides a couple of pre-built requirements, and they are based on claims, basically. But um, you can extend that system. So when you scroll down here, 
you see that, that there's a custom policy. Yeah? And what this basically is, uh, this policy models is, you're only allowed in if you have a top level of manager or, I don't know, whatever. Yeah? Um, so what this really is, this, this method here, is just an extension method on this authorization policy builder that under the covers adds a new requirement to the collection. And when, you, when we look at the requirement, you see it's just a class that models your, your domain. Yeah? In, in that case, it models a job level, so to speak. Yeah? And whenever uh, a, a policy gets invoked that contains this requirement, at runtime, they will look for a, a handler that can deal with this requirement, which is, uh, in our case, the job level requirement handler. Okay? And then they invoke the handle requirement method. And then you can write whatever code you want to, 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 to check if the user is fulfilling the requirement. Yeah? Um, and if you're happy, you call context.succeed on that, which means your requirement succeeded. And if all requirements in the policy agree on success, the policy is a success. Okay? A very deliberate thing here is these handlers live in the DI container, okay? which means, in other words, that they can take other dependencies on other things that also live in the DI container. Yeah? So instead of uh, basically modeling every, everything as a claim, you see this, this thing is just calling an I organization service that might go to a database or might, might call an API, can be you know, mocked for testing purposes and so on. So don't be confused that um, you're not having to model everything now as claims just to use the authorization system because that would be wrong. Yeah? Claims are, for, are good for modeling identity data, they are not very good for modeling permissions. OK? Yeah. OK. Um, yeah, go on, go on, go on. Um, the, the, other, the other part that we don't going to show you, because it's just not time uh, for that, is, is called resource-based authorization, as I said. Um, instead of just looking at the incoming subject, um, you can also add uh, the notion of an operation to it, like uh, read, write, whatever, uh, and, and the resource that this operation will try to manipulate. And this way, you know, you can um, write basically these handlers that take a, a third parameter that is the actual resource that is being manipulated, and um, then you can basically implement your authorization logic there. And you can see how to invoke that, basically. By calling this method here, you pass in the actual object that is being manipulated. You pass in the operation that you are about to do and the user. And then this custom code can you know, de determine if that's allowed or not. Um, it's a framework for Microsoft that you have to buy into. And you know, um, as every framework, you have to figure out, is this what I want? <laughs> or is it more work to just make the framework happy um, than, in, than, than, than building my own. So, you know, um, that's, that, that's just something uh, that, that we learned from a couple of projects that some people didn't like that too much because it was a lot of... <sighs> ceremony. Ceremony, yeah. But the policy stuff, I think, is really brilliant and it's, it's, it's super easy to use. Yeah. Okay, you want to talk about this? Oh, sure. So uh, another important component in the uh, ASP.NET Core security uh, system is a way to track your users in your database. Right? So that's what ASP.NET Identity is. ASP.NET Identity is a framework or a library um, that provides you a lot of the primitives to um, do what's necessary to properly manage user accounts. And a lot of that involves passwords. Right. Uh, having a password when somebody uh, when you store the password, you have to do hashing on it the right way. Um, when somebody comes in and tries to validate, you know, on a login page, validate their password, you need to check that. Um, you need to worry about things like brute force attacks, right? If you've ever written your own login page in your own database for your users, you know, are you counting how many failures you're getting for every failed login? So they do a lot of important things like that. In addition, right, you have to worry about things like password reset. And how do you do that securely? Well, you need email verification. And so there's a whole email verification component to this. And that's hard to do um, right. So it's a really good starting point for building out your identity system. Uh, some other features that they have also is related to multi-factor authentication. And they support things like SMS and authenticator apps. And it's extensible. So you could put in your other type of uh, authenticator systems uh, as well. Um, 
Lastly, not every user will have a password, right? If you're doing external authentication against a Google, you know, Google logins, that user doesn't have a password, but you still need to track that user in your system. So um, it also has the notion of having a record for your user, but linking it to the external provider. Okay? So most of the data stored in the database is predominantly around authentication for your user, um, but you could extend this and put other custom data as well. I pref my preference is to put as little business data into this database, just keep it purely about the authentication properties, you know, email, um, things like that, you know, for a uh, telephone number. Yeah, a telephone number for the multi-factor, things like that, um, or the, the, your link from a Google account, and then the rest of the data put in your business database. At least that's my preference for style. Um, the other thing that this then provides is, so we talked about cookies for establishing your session, and this library is the database. Well, there's a little bit of glue missing in the middle, so they have a little bit additional helpers called the sign-in manager, um, and that's basically a component that uh, will allow you to, on your login page, receive the password, it'll go do the checks in the database, come back and issue the cookie to establish the session. So it can be very blurry, right, where cookies are and where the database is and this thing in the middle. Um, but again, the code is, is up there on GitHub. You can look at it. I frequently have to look at it to remember whose job is it to issue the cookie and whose job is it to check the password. But you know, it's open source, so you can have a look at it. That's encouraging. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> OK. All right. Good. So. The last thing is um, that's the only thing that's really new, so um, you probably haven't seen that yet. Um, we have barely seen it, to be honest. Um, but I, I told you in, at the beginning that, that we are working on this thing called Identity Server, which adds some missing features to ASP.NET Core. So uh, Microsoft implemented all of the things that you need to have for, for consuming tokens, yeah, like the OpenID Connect handler and the JSON Web Token handler. But they were always missing a, a, a good a good f a feature or a, a, a good mechanism to issue these tokens, okay? They, they had several tries. They, they, they tried uh, to, to solve the problem themselves, and it, it got... Uh, they, they, they didn't maintain it in the end because they thought, like, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's actually hard to do it the right way. So, um, um, so, so, so on one hand, we had this thing called Identity Server. On, on the other hand, they had their own identity management library, yeah? Um, and Kind of, uh, they, they approached us oh, well, many years ago and whatever, the long story. <laughs> but uh, the short story is um, that Microsoft now finally, for the next version, ships a little bit of clue that pulls in our identity server, that pulls in their identity management library that Brock just mentioned, and under the covers makes them work together without you having to know all the details. Okay? They call it zero config. Yeah? <laughs> and that's. Um, as we all know, zero config is not a reality, at least not in reality. Yeah, but it's a good starting point. Yeah, so basically the the idea the, 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 um, the experience will be that there will be templates in Visual Studio. You say file new uh, s s uh, tokens secured spa or something like this. Yeah, um, and then you will get you you will get the the, the spa. They they're actually working on um, uh, an Angular and a React version of that. Uh, you will get the spa, you will get your API, and you will get your identity server in just one, one project. Uh, they will set up everything in, uh, so that basically you can press F5, right? That's um, the F5 experience, as they call it, yeah? Yep. Um, um, the, the, the original plan was to ship that with, uh, with an update to ASP.NET Core 2.2. I, to be honest, I'm, I'm doubting this will happen because they are all basically working on 3.0 right now. Um, so, but I actually heard yesterday that in the next preview of 3.0, which will ship by the end of the month, that stuff will be in there. Okay, so th th they're going to ship now a monthly preview uh, of, of 3.0, and that stuff will be in there. That's what I've got told, <laughs> at least, um, <laughs> in the next update. Okay? Um, in the future, there are more advanced scenarios planned, like from, for, you know, microservice uh, uh, scenarios with where you bring up an API, this API registers automatically with the token server and starts using, getting tokens, calling other APIs, and, and so on and so forth. Um, that's probably not coming in the first iteration, so to speak. How can you have a look at that today? Um, as Brock, Brock just said, it's all open source, right? So yeah, just clone the ASP.NET Core repo, okay? 
and check out a tag called release slash 2.2. Okay, <laughs> and then and then you can run that code with with your today.net framework, and you don't have to install any pre-release versions of, of whatever. And then you basically open the ASP.NET identity repo, yeah. And inside of that, there are the integration libraries I just mentioned, and there's a sample, uh, the API auth sample, which has all of these things wired up. So let's, let's have a look at their startup. So what what do they mean with zero config? Basically, you know, all the upper part is just boilerplate ASP.NET identity. Then they pull in our library. They add another line here, which is the zero config they, they talk about. Yeah, so <laughs> that makes all of the things happen under the covers, wires up the right URLs and cookies and blah, blah, blah. Um, and then they give you support for APIs that are embedded in the same application. So you, you don't need to configure key material and authority URLs and audiences and so on and so forth. Okay? Um, yes, and then you can just add APIs with the authorized attribute and, and everything's been taken care of. So let's run it. I, I'm pretty sure they're going to polish that UI um, that they have right now at some point, but that's what you get with the current, um, the current um, repo. And it, it, it's a big solution, apparently, so it takes a bit to run it. Right? Um, so. It's completely unspectacular, okay? So we press the login button, just do that, and it looks like any other ASP.NET Core template, right? It's a login page, but if you have a closer look at the URL here, you can see it's actually a full-blown OpenID Connect request going on under the covers, right? But, yeah, exactly that. <laughs> um, but, you know, it just looks like any other login page, which I think is the right approach because, you know, again, security should be mostly invisible. Yeah. And then we are logged into the application, we call the API, we get back values, very exciting. Um, but it's all <laughs> secure. Okay? So that's basically um, what we've been uh, doing behind the scenes, or they've been doing behind the scenes for quite a while now. And it, it, it seems that in a couple of weeks it, it'll finally, finally be public. Okay. Oh yeah, you can also show the, the JavaScript. Uh, no, 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 show the, show the, the server-side JavaScript. That, that's not going to, no, 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 the, uh, go to index CSHTML. Yeah. That's not going to be the final way how to wire up JavaScript clients to, to tokens. Um, they, they, they have a tag helper here. Yeah, um, that's some, some work there, but uh, from what, I, what they told me is they're actually providing proper Angular and React components for, um, for that now. And that's just an intermediate thing. Okay. Let's go back to slides. Good. So that's it. That's the 60-minute you know, the, the, the version of ASP.NET Core Security. Um, there's a lot of more stuff to learn about it, and, uh, but I hope that gave you a good overview uh, or you know, identify the topics that you want to learn more about. Yeah? Ha have a look at the samples. Um, have a look at the... Ac actually, the, the, the documentation from Microsoft is pretty good these days, I would say. Yeah? So, um, yeah, thanks for that. And if you want stickers, we also have stickers. Thank you. <laughs>